This video investigates the basic physics of bullets at their terminal end of their flight. What they do when they hit an object. Now I'm starting this particular video off with free online data from Hornady.com. It's a ballistic information dealing with their specific product. This is a 300 wind mag, very common round, 150 grain bullet. And if you'll notice when shot from a 24 inch test barrel, their velocity is approximately 3200 feet per second. Here's a rifle. This is a Remington 700. Again, a fairly common device. It has a 26 inch barrel, so you'll get a little bit better performance with a little bit more barrel there to keep pushing the bullet with. You'll also notice that it has 1 in 10 twist. So that means that the bullet will rotate one full revolution in 10 inches. So what does all this mean? Well, let's first look at an example and do some math. Taking a 150 grain bullet, the 300 wind mag, a 26 inch barrel, we may get a velocity similar to 3373 feet per second. Now there are 60 seconds in a minute, so when you do the math, you'll work out that that's 202,380 feet per minute. Let's check the units. Well, seconds on the bottom, seconds on the top. They drop out and the units work. Now, as you may recall, the rifle has a rate of twist of 1 in 10, or 1 revolution for 10 inches. Now, they're 12 inches per foot, so if you do the math, you come out with 12 tenths revolutions per foot, or 1.2 revolution per foot. Let's check the units just to make sure we didn't make a mistake. Inches on the bottom, inches on the top, they cancel out, and we're left with revolutions per foot. So how fast is it rotating? Well, we know 202,380 feet per minute times 1.2 revolutions per foot gives us 242,856 revolutions per minute, or about one-fourth of a million RPMs. Let's check the units to be sure. Feet on the top, feet on the bottom, they cancel out. Yeah, there's our units. Now that's spinning. Now that we've done a little math, and we've talked about numbers that we fit in, and RPMs, that sort of thing, on to look at a bullet. Now we have no trouble with the concept that bullets are moving out of the barrel in a straight line, or actually it's a curved line because of gravity, but out the end, but it also rotates, and that's what the riflings do. They grab the bullet and make it spin, so you have a helix is the actual flight or pattern that is represented by the path of a bullet out of a gun. Now, we need to talk about centripetal force. Centripetal force is a force behavior if you had a center point and you had something like maybe a June bug on a string or the moon over the earth or the earth around the sun. There's a force that is constantly pulling in that point towards the center. Well, if you have motion, orbit, or slinging a June bug around, you have a tangential force. What that, what that is is 90 degrees to the string force or the pull of the gravity force. So it's trying to push it out and it's constantly pushing it away from it, but the string force, the gravity force, is constantly pulling it back down. And so what you end up having, if you have just the correct ratio, you have a perfect orbit too much tangential force to the moon and it would go off into outer space. Too little it would fall to the earth. Now in bullets all of that is contained within a solid body. Fragment paths, what are they? Well we know just like the June bug in a string we have a rotating body, everything is held tightly, everything's balanced and spinning around and around. Well, when we spit a bullet, we're also kicking it at some large velocity away from us, so in this case, around 3,000 feet a second. The bullet, when it strikes the target, begins to deform, the lead and copper comes away from it, they start mushing away, and like a June bug on a string, they keep on rotating for the length of time that that string is intact. When that fragment actually breaks away and becomes just that, a fragment, it leaves the bullet at 90 degrees perpendicular to the axis of rotation. 
Now that's not the path that the fragment actually takes because we have that second vector of the 3,000 feet a second. So the moment it breaks loose, it gets slung away from the bullet based upon the angular momentum, the angular speed, the speed of rotation, but it also continues to progress through the target at a normal rate for that size and mass. Now bullet fragments are small, they have very little energy in most cases, and they will stop much sooner. In fact, it's very uncommon not to have the core or the jacket to continue on and penetrate much, much deeper, perhaps even to exit an animal. In some cases, the core will separate from the jacket altogether. So if you know your way around your toolbox, you know that there are a lot of different hammers, and all of them may be similar in function that you strike with it something. Sometimes they're ball peens for metalwork, perhaps claw hammers for light work, finishing hammers, smooth face, framing hammers, hard driving nails, uh, sledgehammers. Although they're basically the same technology, they are designed and built a little bit differently. Bullets are no different. If you're trying to take a Cape Buffalo down, you need something that will not change shape very much, but will in fact penetrate very, very deeply. Because this is a big, deep, thick animal, and if you're trying to punch all the way into a center of an animal that size, you need something that gives you a very good depth. On the other hand, shooting something like a deer, where they're not that thick to start out with, you want rapid, quick expansion. And the more rapid, quick expansion you're able to have, the more hydraulic shock and energy transfer the bullet will do for you. So it's much like that hammer. You've got a hammer for a different job. Now, here are two products from Nosler. One of them is called the Ballistic Tip. It's a very respected bullet. It's a thin fragmented type of bullet that will break into pieces, transfer energy very, very quickly, and consequently it will actually lose a lot of its weight. Now look at the Nosler Acubon. It is a thicker walled bullet. It is designed to still expand, but to expand at a slower rate, and the way they control that is by using thicker, larger amounts of copper in the actual wall and how they shape the wall, where the thin spots are. And you can compare them right here in this photograph. It's hard to see, but just a little bit of copper can really change the performance of the bullet because lead is generally much, much, much softer. Here are three bullets, all 458 diameter. They are designed for different purposes. The one you see on the right is a solid and it will give a very deep wound channel. It will still mess them because it's a soft point. You see the one in the middle is a hollow point. It's designed so that the cup fills with, with body tissue and expands very, very rapidly. If you'll also notice, the jacket does not go all the way to the tip. That is called a semi-jacket. For obvious reason, it's only partially jacketed. It helps that bullet expand very, very quickly and it's going to give you a bigger damage zone than the solid. If you'll look to the left, you see an all copper barn spitzer. It has a different ballistic coefficient, it's a little longer, it weighs the same as the center bullet, but it's a spitzer and it's all copper and copper is less dense than lead and therefore it, the same amount of weight can be stretched out over a longer period. Also it's a little bit more rigid being all copper. I think when I measure mine, they seem like Barnes bullets always run about a thousandth over what they're supposed to. And I think that's because of the way they have to fit the barrel to make sure they grip tightly without having a softer lead core. Now when that thing expands, it opens up to twice its diameter, but it doesn't fragment. So any of the tissue damage that would bring an animal down by fragmentation, you're not going to get with that Barnes all copper bullet. It just simply doesn't do it. Difference in materials, difference in arrangements, difference in design.